saw and will continue to see as this video progresses is a Siemens SMM 21201P med monochrome CRT monitor from 2005. Uh, these bulky badass buckaroonies were used for displaying high quality medical shit such as people's bones which you know require a high quality image so you can see what the hell is happening inside somebody's body. Here are the specs as far as I've been currently able to find through uh, messing around with custom resolutions. Thanks Siemens for not making it obvious on what the specs are. Its horizontal scanning rate is 100 to 200 kilohertz. That means 100 kilohertz is your minimum. You cannot go below that at all or else it'll just say fuck you and not display anything. But uh, 200 kilohertz, that's a fast fucking beam. Um, the vertical is 54 hertz to 169 hertz, uh, nice. And for reasons I swear I will never be able to discover, it sometimes says no to resolutions that I decide to send to it. You know, despite being in range, um, as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem to be some weird pixel clock limitation either, so, you know, whatever. Now remember, this is a monochrome CRT. This means that it has no mask, which means that there is no slot mask, no shadow mask, I know they're technically the same, shut your ass up, and no aperture grill. Now... This is special because, I mean, well, I mean, you know, monochrome doesn't require a mask, why the fuck would it? But there's nothing to block the beam when it's drawing the horizontal lines to make up the picture. Which means that there's no limited mask pitch that'll cause brightness and resolution resolvability loss, among other things, like... FUCKING MORE! It also means this fucker can get bright, and you will see that later, but, most importantly, it can display any resolution as long as... It's within the horizontal and vertical frequency and isn't pushing the hell out of the gun's amps and also your your DAC, that poor thing. As for the monitor itself, it has a power button. I mean, wow. Go figure, huh? Uh, brightness and contrast up and down as well as a little wrench button, which I will elaborate on later. On the far left, we've got a little door that flips down to reveal a serial port as well as a USB port to charge your fucking iPhone. Then to the left of that is a brightness sensor, so it can automatically adjust brightness based on brightness conditions in your room or wherever you would be using this. I mean, would you be using this outside? Under her plastic bottom is AC power in, USB type B, and two dial-up things that were used for people that aren't me, as well as three B and C connections that are currently in use by me. Next up, we're going to get nude and take a look at the inside of her to see what's cracking. There was a reason for me to do this regardless, so I'll explain that part as well while we're there. Mm -hmm. 
now it's time to talk about the insides of this big brawlic beast. When I first received her, yes, I had this thing shipped, just the fact that it survived should not be an excuse to not call me a dumbass for doing so in the first place. Uh, the bezel was broken, which I already knew before purchasing the unit. This was not shipping damage, it was already a thing to begin with. Um, when I was using the monitor for the first time, it was arcing quite a bit. Uh, if you don't know what that is, an example would be a loud snap sound uh, in the screen doing a number of random things, which in this case was blurring in the raster, inflating a ton, and uh, changing brightness all in the matter of a second. So, it was becoming a bit much, and at that point I couldn't ignore it. Uh, typical reasons for arcing are dirty PCBs, uh, the monitor hasn't been used a while, flyback is dying, and uh, lack of dielectric grease under the anode cap, which helps seal off high voltage to prevent it from leaking out. Uh, there are more reasons arcing can occur, but these are the uh, typical reasons. So, I went for the anode cap because it was the easiest, right? I mean, it's the easiest thing to access once you've got the hood and shield off a tube. <laughs> well, well, fuck you servicemen, is what the people who designed the internals of this monitor said. Ah, uh, the anode cap is against his metal shield with a board on it, and unfortunately the only way to remove the metal shield is to fucking destroy these rivets with a drill. So I said hell no, I'm not doing that. And so I had no other choice but to disassemble the entire monitor from behind to get the tube out, just so I could access the anode cap. Taking out the tube was probably the most tedious thing I have ever done in regards to disassembling something. I will go quiet and show images so you can potentially understand, only through visuals, what my pain was like. Yeah, so that sucked ass. Um, taking the tube's neck out had me doing one of those puzzles where you loop shit with rings. But sadly, when I got the tube out, I had it fall into my lap and... I forgot to unplug a ribbon cable on the neck, which then tore under the tube's weight, yanking it. Which is what the cable happens to be for. I genuinely thought it was over. Sure, I didn't know if the ribbon cable was essential to the monitor's function, so it could have been fine in the end. But I was still very scared. Uh, I can solder, but there was no way I was confident enough to solder this thing back together. Luckily, one of my sweet mates happened to have the soldering skills, and so I went back home to grab my soldering iron and return the same night. Would you believe it, the next morning he cranked it out in 20 minutes. Fucking legend. So now that the ribbon cable was fixed and out of the way, I applied dielectric grease to the anode cap and around its hole. There wasn't any grease there before, so I was confident that this was the solution to the arcing problem that we're facing. After finally being able to assemble the monitor, which happened to be just as painful as disassembling, I powered it on, and... Veil's view, and it fucking arced. Yeah, still arcing, after all that shit. I didn't really care that much, though, because the monitor was working at the very least, and with everything looking fine, the consensus was to just put it back together and... Hope that with the use, the arcing will go away. It actually has, by a lot. It, it barely arcs anymore. Now it's time to get into some fun. Next chapter, we're going to be taking a look at SMFIT ACT, which was the software used to make all the adjustments, diagnostics, and much more in regards to these displays. So, I had initially realized upon using the monitor that it lacks any adjustments besides contrast and brightness. There's nothing on the inside, and referring to a manual I hunted down online, it seems that SMFIT ACT is the software that you need if you are wanting to adjust anything else with these things. 
Getting the software wasn't as easy as a simple Google search, though. Trust me, I, I went through so many hoops and I couldn't find a trace of it anywhere. I emailed Siemens and didn't get a response after a week, so I called them up, was told to call a certain number for ISO because they had nothing to do with the monitor. And then I was eventually able to get my software on a weird site that they hosted. But due to the scarcity of the software, I've uploaded SMFIT Act to a uh, mega link, as well as archive.org to ensure that the software doesn't get lost again because, you know, it very well could have. Both links are in the description if you want to download them. Connecting to SMFIT Act is pretty damn simple. By utilizing the aforementioned serial port on the front, connecting a null modem RS-232 serial cable is all you need to do on the monitor's end. Alright, time for a tour of the software. It's about time we get some fucking footage of the monitor in this video, we're 10 minutes in and I've barely shown anything of the actual display. Alright, so here we are, I'm on my, uh, my little Windows XP virtual machine. Obviously you can make a, you know, Windows XP partition or whatever the hell you want, but I mean, the most convenient way for me, and I feel like the most convenient way in general is to just use a virtual machine. So once you have the uh, software installed, be right here, and you're going to get this window when you open it up. And there's two options right here, and then there's also this remote, but you know, we're not doing a server. Uh, so you have service level one, which just brings you here, and then you have service level two, which allows you to go in only if you enter a password. And the password is... Moni Lisa, I'm, I'm, I don't know why, but um, basically service level two is just service level one, but better. You just get more options, so it, it's just a no-brainer to choose uh, service level two. Um, and what happens when I open this up is that this black thing, uh, this black window that you're seeing is a uh, test pattern, so we just hit high test pattern. Um, but it. It has a lot of uh, test patterns, I, I should mention. There's gray bars, a SMPTE grid, dynamic focus. Basically anything you want is here. E e even colors, you know? Because cause you, you need that on a black and white monitor. So anyways, um, you might notice monitor. One, Siemens CRT offline. Uh, just really quick, I'm going to connect my monitor. There we go. And now, if I go to preferences, check connection. And now, uh, obviously you're going to make sure you have Siemens CRT connected or whatever your monitor may be. It's pretty obvious based on the selections that you have available. If it's a Siemens CRT, then I mean... I wonder what it could be. Um, and then for the serial port, you just open your device manager, go into ports, and you find your serial port, COM5. COM5, check connection. We'll say it's okay like you just saw. Serial port, obviously, and then, okay. All right, so as you can see, it is no longer Siemens CRT offline. It is now the model number with what I assume is a version because you have V. Um, and then it also tells you the frequency you're currently running, which is 134 kHz, 60 Hz, which is currently 1620 by 2160 p And aspect ratio 4x3, even though it's 3x4. I wish it was 4x3, because then it would be easier to do 4x3 resolution, since it's a 4x3 monitor. Uh, regardless, um, it's connected. So now we're going to go through all of these options that we have available to us with the beautiful... Siemens CRT right here on the right. So, starting from the top, systems, serial number. That's the serial number of the monitor. Pretty self-explanatory. Error log. Well, it's, you know, it's an error log, also pretty self-explanatory. Apparently, the monitor actually stores errors on it. Um, sweet. That's that's a good sign. <laughs> um, and then the bus address, which, you know, RS-232, serial stuff. Uh, data. Data? Did I just say data? No, I said data. Data? <laughs> uh, you can basically... So, if you're familiar with Windass, this is basically just Windass, but not ass. It's wind good. Um, you just... If, if you're making uh, 
you know, things, changes, whatever on your monitor, you can save it to a, full, uh, a file, and then you can load it up so you don't screw anything up. You can convert it to Excel, ASCII, there's a selection list. And then you can load after replacing the deflection board. I obviously don't have a spare deflection board, but, you know. Very, very, very handy stuff right there. Um, then configuration. You can lock the membrane key switch. I will get to what this is later. Um, you can disable timings. So, I'm sure there's, and there's obviously a reason for this. I mean, it exists for a reason. But you can block uh, certain timings. Um, these, I did not choose these on my own. These were just here. Um, but yeah. Brightness and contrast. So you can adjust the brightness and the contrast uh, manually through this. And they directly correlate with how they would on the buttons with the monitor. And you might notice the contrast minimum slider right here on the bottom. Basically, think of it as... Well, the minimum contrast you can have it at. So see how it's at 186 right here? So if I pull up a... I'm going to pull up a... Let's see. Let's do a brighter. We'll do the color spectrum, you know? N nice, and, nice and colorful. Um, but basically, if I put it below 148, it's not going to make a difference. And so... If I put this above... As you can see, it gets brighter. And if you max out the contrast minimum, what I believe it does is bypass the ABL on the monitor, which is auto brightness limiter, basically. On brighter things, it'll make it darker, uh, just because of power usage and stuff. Um, and so I think that you can actually bypass APL, uh, ABL if you max this out, because it gives it a number that it can't go below. So, you might notice that if I put this all the way to 255, the monitor becomes way brighter. And I actually measured... <laughs> I measured this with the full white screen on. You might remember that photo I showed of it lighting up my whole room. Um, I measured that with my colorimeter. That is 500 nits. So, yeah. I, uh, I, I think that's a record with, um, with the CRT. Uh... And now, let's see, power down an ambient light sensor, so you can turn on and off the, um, sensor, the light sensor, which, you know, adjusts the brightness based on the conditions of your room, so if it's light in your room, it'll probably brighten up the image a bit more, you know, vice versa. Uh, pulse length of video clamping. I don't really know what this is, I know it has to do with the signal, obviously, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of about it. Um. And then jumper settings, these, I'm sure, just have to do with the jumper. Uh, the jumpers on the boards and the monitor, blah, blah, blah. And now it's time for the stuff that I truly got this software for. So, the adjustment, geometry, um, horizontal position. Yep. And you might notice that you actually have a number here and then a number here. This is the number of what you're adjusting. So you can see the number fluctuates as I go left and right, blah, blah, blah. But it keeps this number here. That's your original value. This is very, very useful. Because you don't have to write down the shit that, you know, it was before. And if you've used Windass to do shit with your Sony monitor, you might know how this is a pain in the ass. I've dealt with that. It's very annoying. So, it's, it's very nice to have a software that actually cares and just keeps it there for you. And so now, we have Video Amplifier. And, I'm not really sure what this is exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I can say for that one. But, uh, focus. Now, this is very cool. You have your brightness and contrast right here on the top. And then you have the static focus. But then you have... All of these dynamic focus adjustments here. And then on the right, you have point to point and wave control. And I'm not sure exactly what these options are, but what I can tell you. Well, I mean, I know what they are, but I don't know how to use them exactly. Um, I haven't learned them yet, but what I can tell you is that with the dynamic focus, you can adjust specific points of the screen to uh, make it sharper or blurrier. I mean, you obviously want sharper, 
But it's it is so so nice to have these. It's very advanced. Um, and then you have even luminance, so you can adjust the luminance on certain parts of the screen. So if it's not uniform, it's like some parts are darker than the other, then you can correct that with this. Diagnostics you can have online error monitoring, and then a toolbox, which you can turn on and off deflection, turn on and off power, you can have a test line, reset the processor, enable video service, and then you can upload or download the firmware. Um, I've tested some of this. Uh, this one literally just, yeah, bright as shit. So now we have info, you can have the version, there it is, and then operating hours. Now, this is very cool because you get to see how long the monitor's been running. Um, this is really not bad. Honestly, 2,186, that's perfectly fine. Upon having uh, way more experience with the software as time has gone on, um, it turns out that these hours are different compared to what you would expect from uh, like total uh, hours. Because it turns out that when you export the file from the monitor, like the, the .dat file, it actually has the total amount of hours that have just been accumulated over the entire course of uh, usage. And it turns out that this one actually has 40,000 hours. Which is mind-blowing because it's pretty fucking bright. And it has no issues that would be indicative of said hours, so... It's pretty cool. Um, and then test pattern, you have... All of these. You can go through all of these. It's super useful. I'm sure I, I don't use it because I have, uh, you know, NEC test and Sony's. But you can even put in your own. I mean, it, it's it's so cool with what you can have with this shit. Look, look how in-depth this gets. Uh, you can show it on all monitors, clear the test pattern, hide it. It's, it's so nice. Um, and then in health... There it is, and then contents. Um, same thing as before with the help. I didn't choose the PDF. Um, the luminance calibration. So if I had the... Uh, there's a little luminance measurer that comes with the SM Fit Act package. I obviously don't have it, but normally they would have had that. If you perform the cali calibration, I don't have it. Um, but if I did kind of neat then same thing here and then also has to do with that and then I don't really know what these are um but they just have to do with that stuff but yeah that's that's kind of it with uh, SM Fit Act it's it's a very very nice piece of software I was expecting it to be way better than Windass and it is um, the manual was so helpful with setting it up. It's, it's just such a nice piece of software. Alright, so before we head to the, uh, the main stuff, you know, showing shit on the actual monitor... I thought I'd just make an extra section just for uh, extra details that I didn't really have a spot to fit in during the whole explanation for everything else. Um, so that's what this section is going to be for. I mean, you're welcome to skip. Obviously, there's no obligation for you to fucking sit here. But um, I thought I'd just go over that, so... Alright, so the first thing we're going to be looking at is the high voltage regulation. Which is absolutely fucking crazy on this monitor. So, basically if the regulation isn't really that good, um, as things tend to get brighter, the raster, as in the entire picture being displayed, will uh, kind of shrink or distort in a little way. It's pretty obvious. I'll show some examples on screen as I'm talking about this, but if you know, you know. Okay, so here we go. I've got my NEC test pattern pulled up here, and just to uh, really stress the hell out of it, I am running this monitor at 
2025 by 2700, which is 167 kilohertz. So it's being well stressed in quotations. Um, but anyways, let me pull up the test here and we will see how it holds up. As you can see, jack shit. I'll zoom in for you. Zero movement. So if I hit lock membrane key switch here and then hit service on and press OK, the gear button then has these options where I can adjust the screen. Like how I would in geometry, so I have horizontal size and vertical size, but uh, I can just use a gear for that. And the contrast and brightness act as the sliders for whatever I'm adjusting. Alright, so another thing that I'm going to show is the motion clarity of this thing. And you might think, oh, well, yeah, you know, it's a CRT, it's going to have good motion clarity. But there is something that blew my mind when I fully realized it. And I remember when I was playing uh, CSGO on this thing at 169 hertz. Um, and it looked, it looked great, but it looked better than my main CRT monitor. And, you know, I, I found that strange, and I remember eventually, um, I was on my desktop, and my desktop was just like a black background, and I was dragging around a, um, a bright thing, and I noticed there are no phosphor trails. And, um, that made me realize that this thing, technically speaking, is an instant response display. It has zero response times. So, I'm showing pictures of a pursuit camera right now on, on screen that I, you know, I just tracked and took a picture of it. And as you can see, there are no phosphor trails. I will drag this window here, okay? This bright window. I will drag it around, and I will overexpose the image so you can really make out the fact that there are no trails. It is, it is unlike anything I have ever seen before, and I would really like to know what type of phosphor is used in this thing. I don't think I'll ever know, but um, you might notice on camera that sometimes there's like a green uh, like tint to it in motion. You can't really see that in person, uh, in motion, but there are some times when you're looking at it that you'll kind of see that. It's very strange, but it makes for an exhilarating experience when you're playing fast-paced stuff. Alright, so the next thing I'm going to be showing is how uh, deflection works with this thing. And when I say that, I'm specifically talking about how the image is drawn. And I'm going to show a pretty cool thing that I discovered um, when I was making resolutions on this thing. This thing has a 100 kilohertz minimum. Uh, for some reason, and I... I Put a little note earlier when I was talking about the specs, how recently it has a 120 kilohertz minimum. I have not been able to figure out why that is, but I'm kind of just leaving it at that for now. I I've looked around, but uh, anyways, so I have to have a 120 kilohertz minimum if I want to have anything to display on it. And so I decided to bump up the vertical total of a resolution to... Uh, reach that. So I'm going to show an example of doing that here. Oops. And basically I'm just trying to show how you can add so many lines to the vertical total and it will you'll still be able to stretch it to the full uh, size of the screen. So I have 1440 by 1080 and the thing is rotated so it's 90 kilohertz right now. Normally um, this would be like 67 kilohertz if it was 4x3, but technically speaking, this is the vertical, this is the horizontal, just because it's rotated. So, if I was to take the total, uh, vertical lines, let's see, bump that up there, oh, whoops, here we go, bump that up here, it's 96, let's do like 2000, right? 
Okay, there we go. So that is 120 kilohertz. And as you can see, I bumped this up by like, what? It's just like 600 lines, right? Um, and so I'm going to apply that. All right, so here we are. We've got our uh, NEC test display pattern pulled up right here just to show I am, in fact, running 1080 by 1440p. Um, and after this, I will explain the 3x4 and 4x3 thing. Um, but first, I just want to show this. So we've got the pattern pulled up, and I'm going to go into SMFit Act, go to my geometry, and here we go. So I will stretch this out all the way. I'll move it around. Let's see. And as you can see, I actually need to lower my vertical total. So I will lower that. Move this a bit more. We will move the horizontal down. And as you can see, 600 extra lines have been added to the vertical total to go up by about 30 kilohertz. And yet I am still able to fit the screen. Wow. All right, now for the 3x4 and 4x3 thing I was talking about. So, like I said, I mentioned earlier that this monitor scans 3x4 natively. And so what that means is that when this thing is actually oriented the way it's meant to be, like actually standing up and showing 3x4, because right now, as you might be able to tell, I have it on its side. And that's so I can use it in 4x3, because... Yes, this thing literally does scan 3x4, and I will show this white screen and zoom in for you. And I might have to get a little bit closer to the screen, so let me just move the camera. This is at the resolution 1000 by 700 at 120 hertz, but in actuality, it's 700 by 1000 at uh, 120 hertz, and so. You can see that the, uh, the lines, they're vertical, and that's because this monitor is rotated on its side. So, it is drawing 1,000 lines, and because of that, it is kind of annoying, because if this was a 4x3, to, like, if, if it scanned 4x3, I could do 1600x1200 at 120Hz. But, unfortunately, if I want to rotate that to 4x3, I'm going to have to do 1200 by 1600 at 120 hertz so while the 200 kilohertz is you know fucking crazy it kind of balances itself out with the fact that it's 3 by 4 so that is kind of unfortunate but interlacing you know kind of throws all that all that out the window and it becomes a win-win so it's not the end of the world obviously all right, next up, we're going to be showing the spot size as well as the resolution resolvability and all that fun stuff. And I have pulled up right here uh, a test pattern on Sony's little test pattern software. This is one of the focus test patterns. And I decided to pull it up just, I feel like it would be a, a decent way to show the scan lines that I get on this resolution. And... So first off, I'm going to move the camera a little bit closer to the screen so you can see the details. And I'm going to have you guess, just for a second, what resolution I might be running right now. Alright, now that we're up to the screen, you might be able to notice the uh, visible scan lines. Um, obviously, they're vertical. I explained earlier why that is. Let me adjust focus a little more so you can see them right in the center. And yeah, those are scan lines. Very obvious. So now, take a quick guess on what resolution I might be running here. Alright, what I'm running here is 1200 by 1600 p at 60 hertz. That is 1600 horizontal lines. And yet, I still get scan lines. Next up, I'm going to show a really high resolution to show what I might get for scan lines. But just put this into perspective that this is 1200 by 1600. This monitor is 21 inches. Imagine 1600 by 1200p at 60 hertz running on your average 21 inch, uh, you know, Sony Trinitron monitor. It probably looks amazing, and it should, but you don't get scan lines with something like that because the spot size just is not that fine. But on this, 1600 horizontal lines gives you this. 
All right, for this one, we are going to show the uh, resolution resolvability and what I'm currently displaying right now. Um, and this is before, if I go any higher than this resolution, my DAC will crap out. And the DAC that I'm using for this is a D Lock 87685. And it is a like over 500 megahertz DAC. Um, very expensive, but it's the best tool I can use when it comes to something like this. And so, what I'm displaying is 2025 by 2700. And remember, that is 27 horizontal lines being drawn. So, it looks great, and this is a progressive signal. 60 hertz, and if I zoom in, I'm gonna get a little bit closer. I'm gonna pull up that same uh, test pattern so you can really understand what we're looking at here. Okay, so, zooming into the test pattern a bit more, we can see that, yes... There are still some lines, and if you see that wobbling that is from the deck, it's being pushed pretty hard right now. There are, in fact, still some visible scan lines. I'll get even closer for you. Yeah, you can see them. They're very faint, but they are there. So you can tell from the images that I showed of the test pattern that it isn't necessarily extremely sharp, and I feel like that is definitely a result of the bandwidth that I'm pushing there because if I plug this into custom resolution utility just to take a little bit of a look um, I'm gonna put this on my monitor you can't really see it on uh, on camera right now but if I plug this in that is 471 megahertz that's almost 500 megahertz and it is drawing that 167,000 times a second 167 kilohertz it's definitely not the spot size, because you can see that there's, you know, there's scan lines. I think that sharpness decrease ultimately does come from the fact that we're just pushing the gun super duper hard. And you gotta, you know, you gotta give it credit where credit's due. It still looks fantastic um, at a resolution like this. I do want to push this thing to see where the limitation for the spot size comes in. But my DAC just isn't powerful enough to push something like 20, uh, 2160 be, uh, by 2880 progressive. Uh, it can definitely reach that resolution that's within 200 kilohertz. But I just can't do that progressive. I can do it interlaced. And you will see that in the uh, final montage that I show of all the content running on this thing. I'm not going to pull it up right now because I have to switch DACs to uh, do that. But... This is pretty fascinating for how high of a resolution that it is running at. Alright, so originally I was going to show the TV line count or TVL count of this monitor as well as the uh, LOHR lines of horizontal resolution. But upon spending countless hours trying to figure out how to properly and accurately uh, measure it, I've just, I feel like I've run into too many walls to the point where I'm not confident on what it would be if I was to declare it. I, I, I just feel like it wouldn't be accurate and I could be easily wrong. So unless I find something out, I'm not going to put it in this video. Since there is inevitably going to be a follow-up video, I'll most likely include it in there. But as for this video, I'm just going to keep it out. Because I don't want to put anything up that m might be false and might seem insane, but then it turns out, you know, it's not correct. The last thing I'm going to be showing here for the for this chapter is the fact that this monitor also has a feature that calibrates the black level automatically uh, after the monitor has been turned on for about 30 minutes. And when that happens, the screen does this. It's a pretty cool feature. It, it does it pretty well, so I, I welcome it. Right, it's time for the moment we've been waiting for, or uh, skipping for, if uh... You are who you are. Basically, this is gonna be a montage of a bunch of games that uh, I asked around for uh, what people would want to see on this monitor, as well as my own personal picks. Um, these are all, obviously, like the rest of this video, going to be recorded at 4K60, so... Hopefully they're gonna look the best they can, uh, you know, by not being able to see with the human eye. Uh, if there are any details that I've skipped, I'll be sure to include them in the uh, description or in a pinned comment. 
but I also want to make sure that for anything that I've missed or for any important questions that should be addressed, um, I'll leave that maybe in the description as I update it and as people comment and other stuff like that. But without any further ado, thank you for watching all this shit that I put together. I got this monitor in uh, January of this year, 2022, and I've been kind of holding it off and learning how some shit works so I make sure I'm pretty accurate when I'm making the video and it's it's been a whole thing it's time for the part of the video that I was looking forward to the most I tried my best to make it all cinematic and cool and stuff so hopefully you enjoy it as much as I do